Hello, everybody. My name is John Billingsley, and I play Dr. Philip Flox in Star Trek Enterprise. And congratulations, you're listening to Trek Untold. to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I'm your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. And welcome to the very first Trek Untold of 2023. Last year was a great one and saw some amazing guests stop by, and the next 12 months will be no different. I hinted at it in an older episode, but there is a lot of folks coming up this year whose Trek stories have never been told in depth, and others whose stories have never been told at all. As far as this podcast itself, Trek Untold has also gone through some changes in the last year, including new theme music, how I run the show, and also moving over to a new YouTube channel. And speaking of, if you aren't already, do make sure you subscribe now over at youtube.com slash at Trek Untold, and that's the at symbol like you'd use on Twitter. So youtube.com slash at Trek Untold, so that you don't miss a thing. And even if you're not watching these interviews on YouTube and you're just listening to the audio ones, there's going to be some exclusive video content there that you're going to want to tune into and not miss out on. So make sure you head over there and hit that subscribe button. I have high hopes for 2023 and some big personal goals, like building out that aforementioned YouTube channel, growing my social media pages, and becoming better at interacting on them, which is something I can definitely improve on, uh, and also getting my Patreon up to snuff. I'm always thankful for the supporters that I have, and I would welcome some new faces there too, which, by the way, you can join that on patreon.com slash trekuntold for free to get some special things there. And if you wanna become a paid Patreon supporter to get some other exclusive benefits, well, you'll learn about that later, but you can do that too. And yes, I am shilling a little bit early in the show, but that's because there is a lot going on and a lot of ways you can be part of this community. And really, that's what I wanna accomplish this year with this show. I want to build the Trek Untold community. Maybe we'll call that the Trexcavators. I don't know. We'll see how that works out here. But ultimately, the goal is to interact with everyone more to give you something very unique from this podcast that you can't get anywhere else. But that's enough about my plans and goals for this year. I don't want to keep you waiting any longer because 2023 is beginning with a big guest. On this episode, the doctor is in the house because John Billingsley is stopping by to chat. You most likely remember John as Dr. Phlox from all four seasons of Star Trek Enterprise. He is a character actor extraordinaire, and his list of credits beyond Trek is long and prolific. John is hilarious, highly intelligent, self-deprecating, and a wonderful human being. And coming up later this month, he's going to be part of the Trek Talks Telethon event to raise money for the Hollywood Food Coalition. We're going to spend some time discussing that, as well as plenty of Trek Talk, and also answering some of your questions. If you're not following me on social media or Patreon, this is the stuff you're missing out on, and this is why I'm stressing for you guys to come over and be part of this community. And for this interview, you guys have really surprised me with some of the truly excellent questions, many of which I hadn't even thought of myself. So John and I got through as many of them as we could from what I picked, and that means there is a lot of fun stories and great behind the scenes tales from Enterprise and a whole lot more. John is embarrassed by nothing, so yeah, we're going pretty deep here with a lot of really, really fun stuff. So without further ado, let's head over to sickbay and spend some time with the good doctor, Mr. John Billingsley. But before we begin this week's episode, I want to remind you to follow Trek Untold on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Trek Untold, all one word. You can get show updates, check out some fun memes, and let me know what you think about what's going on with the current events in the Star Trek universe. You can also support this show directly on Patreon at patreon.com slash trekuntold, where you can support this show for as little as $2 a month. At higher tiers, you can listen to the shows before they come out, know about my guests well in advance, and even have a chance to ask them questions, get transcripts of these episodes to make sure you get all the info, and more benefits coming soon, including watch parties and live streams. But that's all dependent on more fans like you coming over and letting me know you want to be a part of events like that. If you want some Trek Untold merchandise, check out our store for gear and apparel, including shirts, hats, stickers, water bottles, notebooks, and a whole lot more. 
New designs will be added throughout the year, so it's always worth taking a peek. Trek Untold also has an Amazon shop where you can peruse everything Star Trek, sci-fi, and geeky on Amazon in one convenient location. If you're looking for a gift for the Trekkie in your life, or maybe want to see some of my favorite non-Star Trek things that you can get for yourself, check out the link for my Amazon shop in the show notes on the audio version and in the description below this video on YouTube. If you're listening to us on iTunes or any other audio platforms that allow for ratings and reviews, please leave us a five-star rating and a positive review to help out this show. If you're watching it on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to us at youtube.com at Trek Untold and give the video a thumbs up and a comment. All of these things help more people find this show and to continue growing and bringing you awesome guests each and every week. Now, without further ado, let's beam in this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. And welcome back to Trek Untold. And now joining me on the other side of the screen, I am very excited. I'm very ecstatic. I'm clearly very enthusiastic and very eager to introduce today's guest. We are joined today by Dr. Flox himself, Mr. John Billingsley. John, how are you? Uh, I'm wonderful, thank you. And Bukat. And we have Bukat in the house today, too. Yes, you do. It's not quite a Porthos. It's not quite a Beagle, but I think it's personally let's better. Let's take a good look at Boo Boo. Come on. You want to look for the camera? Oh, he's so shy. He's such a retiring type. That's right. <laughs> I'll make up and brashness what he lacks. Oh, well, thank you for that, John. I look forward and, to hearing that. Uh, absolutely. Catch the chrome <laughs> dome there. Now you've got me in all my glory. <laughs> Well, yeah, thank you so much for being here today. You know, I, I sent out a big thing on social media to let folks know I was talking to you, and I got a ton of feedback, a ton of questions for you, which we're going to get into as we progress here. But first, I got to ask you my I'm stuff. I got to get my I'm things intrigued. in. I'm intrigued. I'm oh, intrigued. We got right. some real good stuff, John. I'm actually, uh, this is some real high quality questions here we got, and we're going to dive into things beyond Trek also. So there's some good stuff here. Let me hit you up with my first question. I love to ask all my guests, John, and that's, uh, what's your earliest memory of Star Trek? Did you grow up watching it? I was six years old in 1966 when it premiered. Um, I did not have a memory of watching it, although I later on found out that, in fact, I did sneak in to watch it with my brother, who was seven years older. And so uh, my earliest legitimate memory is when I watched it in reruns in uh, the New York area on, I believe, Channel 11. It was on in the afternoons. I'd come home from school and I'd watch Star Trek. I'm sure I saw all the original episodes by the uh by the end of my my pre-adolescent years and then i was i was uh wandering about doing this that and the other doing doing theater primarily for all the years when the next gen and deep space were on and didn't really grok um voyager so when i got enterprise i i confess that i knew very little about the modern star trek world i had to get a crash course and who who are the pejorans and who are the andorians and who 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 are those people but i had some willing friends who took me to uh took me to star trek college and shout out to wpix 11 that's my network also for star trek wpix there wow. we go there you go and, you know, while we are, of course, here to talk about Star Trek, there is something else more important that we have to talk about this tied into Star Trek. Uh, and that's going to be that John is going to be part of the Trek Talks to Telethon, which benefits the Hollywood Food Coalition. And, John, really, I think this is the most important thing we're going to talk about today. So uh, let's just start off this podcast with, about that. Uh, what can you tell my listeners about the Trek Talks to Telethon and the Hollywood Food Coalition? Fabulous. I'll start with the Hollywood Food Coalition, since that's the cause this is designed to support. It's about 40 years old. It started as street corner service for people experiencing homelessness, hot meals, and various emergency provisions. And as it grew and evolved into a more elaborate multi-course dinner that we served indoors, when I got involved about six years ago, my sense was, as was the case with my, my wife, we, we felt that both expanding the quality of the food that could be provided and ultimately sharing the food that we collected with other organizations might be a lifeline to help grow community awareness of the work we were doing. So a lot of the work has been about trying to bring more good food to more people in Los Angeles. And we currently rescue about 2 million pounds of food a year, which we share with about 130 other organizations to help buttress and augment their meal programs. So we are touching and affecting the lives of thousands of people a day. We continue to serve a hot, nourishing meal. We continue to provide emergency resources. We partner with a lot of other social service providers to help our clients gain access to housing programs, mental health programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we sit at a lot of tables where we work with other community groups who are trying to come up with 
solutions to the systemic problems, more transportation, more refrigeration, more capacity to share food, the kinds of things you can only do collaboratively. So that's the Hollywood Food Coalition in a nutshell. I was the board president for a number of years. I've been very, very involved for the last six. Track Talks arose out of a conversation I had with Bill Smith and Dan Davidson, Trek geeks, your your allies in podcasting. Shout out to Trek geeks. They're the ones who helped uh, connect us for this interview. Indeed. And John Champion, the wonderful John Champion with Roddenberry Podcasts, also a dear friend I've known for years. They had, uh, Bill and Dan had done a, an event with Jonathan Frakes to promote uh, Feeding America. And they'd raised a little money and I was on their show and we were talking about that. And I said, I wonder if we could get more guests from Star Trek to come and make it kind of a Jerry Lewis-esque telethon. And we tried it last year. And much to our surprise, everybody we asked to attend said yes. So I was like, oh, I guess this is going to be six hours long. And so it was. And we raised $80,000 for the Hollywood Food Coalition in great part because of very generous contribution from Rod Roddenberry himself. And we thought, well, we got to do this again. So we're doing it again. On January 14, Trek Talks 2, which will start at 10 o'clock in the morning Pacific and go till 6 o'clock. We've got some fabulous guests. Brent Spiner is going to be there. I, I'm actually going to keep some of these guests kind of in reserve because some of them have asked to, you know, not be announced publicly until the first of the year. Oh, you we've tease, some, John. You tease. We've got some. We've got a couple that are really going to be like, oh, my God. <laughs> so but John Delancey is going to be there. Terry Farrell is going to be there. Nana is going to be there. Some wonderful, the, the Hageman brothers are going to be there. A lot of panels. We'll have some musical interludes. Bonnie Gordon and I are hosting. She is a marvelous, effervescent person who I think is worth the price of admission in her own right. And the price of admission, by the way, is just, if you can, consider this a convention that you don't have to get out of your pajamas to attend. If you could consider making a donation to the Hollywood Food Coalition, if you watch, trektalks.net will take you to the Hollywood Food Coalition. It'll take you to, so you can learn more about us. It'll take you to the various, either number of platforms you can watch the show on. Trektalks.net is pretty much your one link that tells the whole darn story. And for anybody who's coming to this podcast a little bit late, a little bit after uh, the Trek Talks 2 telethon happens, I also want to suggest you guys go to the Hollywood Food Coalition's official website at hofoco.org to see how you can continue to support them even when this event is not going on. Absolutely. And you know, John, the thing is, I've, I've spoken to a few other folks in the LA area who do a lot of charity work. And uh, I know, especially during the pandemic, like the the homeless and people living below the poverty line have been hit extra hard. And so, you know, what you guys are doing is really, really extra important, especially this time of year. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, it's funny because I think one of the things that I always want to stress is that while we we serve our our meal to certainly a healthy contingent of people who are experiencing homelessness, it's for all comers. So sometimes people who are coming to the line are simply people who couldn't make their paycheck stretch. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the organizations we work with, for instance, we work with veterans groups, we work with a wonderful organization called the Vill Village Family Services that works with at-risk kids. We work with uh, groups that support women who've experienced uh, abuse and have fled their homes. We really are trying to say that there are any number of groups that are doing really cool and wonderful things for their particular constituencies, and that really raising the quality of the meal service they provide raises their capacity to actually engage their clients and their customers in the work that they're doing. Uh, there's one story I always tell, which to me is very significant. Village Family Services, which offered great classes and workshops and symposiums and whatever for the kids to come and, and, and you know, kind of maybe dig into building their lives up. Their lunch program kind of consisted of, you know, bologna sandwiches. Um, maybe sometimes they had a little mini Weber barbecue they throw a hot dog on. We started rescuing food from TV shows and movie shoots years ago. And we started providing them with food that we picked up directly from catering. So we were bringing in for a period of time the food that was served on the prom, which was featuring Meryl Streep. So we were bringing, you know, there's fried chicken and, and collard greens and mashed potatoes and corn in the cob and peach cobbler and yada, yada, yada. And one, the kids were like, this is great food. And two, it was like, wait, I'm eating Meryl Streep's lunch. <laughs> and the kids were like, and they started coming back, you know, not that they weren't excited by the programming, but the uh, the allure of a great lunch 
is is a you know it always starts from that you know that's something we believe is that the one thing you need to do every day is you need to have a great meal mm. need some some of our clients it's the only meal they're going to have all day yeah we always want to provide choice we want to make sure that people who come to our line have the ability to choose between vegan vegetarian and 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 meat oriented dishes multiple salad choices including a fruit salad multiple dessert choices ultimately we really want to have right now we're on uh, uh, another campus we don't own the property when we have our own facility which we're building towards we really want to be able to have a true sit down meal with a menu and servers so that people who can who do not frequently are not treated with the respect they deserve actually have the opportunity to feel the dignity of being fully you know seen yeah, there's such a heavy stigma with uh, not just people outside of looking, you know, but not just people outside looking in at these kinds of places, but also the people who have to go to these places. And you know, it's it's tough. So the fact that you're treating them like actual human beings and giving them an experience that is not just like the typical shelter experience, I think that is what's really most amazing and honorable about, about what you guys are doing. So, you know, honestly, it was a great opportunity for me to have an excuse to talk to you, but also I'm very very proud to be able to uh, be part of supporting what you guys are doing here and spreading the word about it because it truly is some excellent work you're doing. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. And if you're willing to to spread the word between now and the 14th, that's fabulous. We're putting little announcements out, you know, over the course of the next three, four weeks, three or four guests dropping them at a time. Anything you can do to spread the word is much appreciated. Well, we got a whole captive audience here today. So uh, they're listening and I'm hoping a lot of them are going to go support the event. So if you do want to support Trek Talks 2, there's going to be links in the show notes for this episode. So do make sure you check them out. Uh, now, John, you know, I want to spend some time taking a deep dive today into flocks, and I've been doing my homework and going back and watching some good old Enterprise episodes again and uh, reminding myself what a good show that was, by the way. I, I really bet forgot. you're going to surprise me with the information you know about Denobula and flocks that I have long forgotten. I actually re- refreshed my own memory by going and reading some of the uh, some of the literature that exists about Denobula. It's like, I didn't know that. We were? <laughs> oh, my. Well, you'll be surprised with some of the questions because I'm, uh, you know, here, here in Truck and Told, we're not like that kind of a podcast. We're we're a bit different oriented. I think you're gonna enjoy uh, the experience. At least I'm hoping you will. So uh, fire I'm gonna, away. I'm gonna quit rambling. I'm gonna fire away. So uh, I would love to hear, starting at the very beginning of your time as Flox, what was the audition process like for this character? Uh, now I'm I'm sure because uh, as my friends will tell you, I, I I will go to the opening of an envelope. So I've done a lot of podcasts and I've done a lot of conventions. So probably ninety percent of your your listeners have heard this story before. But for what it's worth, so I've I've truncated it. When when I got the material, all it said was come in just this just one scene, come in with a slight alien accent. Like I don't know what that means. So I practiced with the wife, all sorts of different funny voices. My wife just said nope 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 stinks sucks nope 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 until the voice that you more or less are familiar with from flocks. But I thought, oh, that's just, I don't know. That's not enough. It sounded vaguely lilty East Indian kind of thing. I, maybe on his home planet, he was a bird and he squawked. So I went in and I auditioned and, you know, the key thing I think about flocks was he was buoyant. He was exuberant. So I thought, you know, in moments of joyous transport or when he was particularly excited, he would go. Blah, 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 blah. And I got the job. Like, huh. I guess I'm a bird. So all through the prep stuff, you know, when they're getting the makeup and we're having table reads, I'm thinking, I'm a bird. Nobody says anything. I don't look like a bird. I'm not dressed like a bird. My makeup doesn't make me look like a bird. The creators aren't asking me to be a bird. I'm not, I like, should I be like reading about birds? Should I be flapping my arms? I don't know. Am I a bird? I even asked Rick and Brandon after a table read. I, I'd squawked during the table read. I'd squawked during the network callback. So what is, am I a bird? And they kind of, they're very inscrutable cats. They kind of went, it's like, all right, take that to the bank. So first day, first scene that I'm shooting where I would have cause to squawk. We, Jim Conway was a director. I go, blah, 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 blah. And Jim Conway says, quit fucking around, John. Which is how I knew I was not a bird. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's my audition story. People have said, oh, I don't believe that. But Dominic Keating will, will testify. He was outside in the lobby when I was going in for my callback with producers, and he heard this guy going, rrr, rrr, rrr. He said, who the hell is that? He's got balls. <laughs> At first, he thought I was auditioning for his part. He thought, I, how could he possibly have justified squawking for Dominic, for, for Reed? Why does Reed squawk? Yeah, I just heard that story, in fact, on the Shuttle Pod show also, because I know you did an appearance with them uh, almost almost a year ago, not quite a year ago, but yeah, a lot of great stories on that show as well. 
Uh, but, you know, kind of digging into the acting side of things, you know, I'm curious to know what sort of homework you did once you got the role in working on a backstory. Like, did you create a backstory for Phlox in your head? Like, what did you do to become the character? To an extent. But, you know, I'm I'm generally speaking, and particularly the older I get, it's on the page. I mean, mm -hmm. the scene the scene is fundamentally about a, a set of actions and intentions, what you're trying to do. And your your characterization is really based on your sense of what animates this guy. And this guy was clearly animated by a sense of adventure and curiosity and exuberance. My sense in a way was that he was, he came from a species and I didn't elaborate a very lengthy backstory about his culture because, you know, one, I know I'm anything I come up with is going to be immediately contradicted by the writers. But my sense was that, you know, he was old enough and had lived a long enough life as a long lived species that for him, this was sort of the last hurrah. So, you know, by kid, by wives, by planet, I'm going to go off and probably it's a suicide mission. And that's OK. I'm going to go out having fun, exploring the world. And if they blow my head off, so be it. So uh, I, I, on that level, you don't necessarily need to kind of do a whole, what did my character have for breakfast this morning? And, you know, 18 gene genealogical charts. Mm -hmm. I will say that I thought that perhaps because we'd never heard of Denobulans before, they, that, you know, there are only nine of us left and he, they come from a monastic world only to later find out that we're the fuck bunny <laughs> of the galaxy. And we all have, you know, like <laughs> we're chock-a-block. <laughs> um so it's like where are where are we all then how come the universe isn't crawling with denobulans i mean is this part of your theater training where it's kind of like the text is giving you the information as opposed to you going out and doing your own homework to like define the character on your own terms i think so i think it's an evolution as an actor you know when you're younger you put a lot of attention into what i would think now is extraneous detail in this conversation right now, you know, there are any number of things that might be passing through your head, but they're thoughts that are related to the conversation we're having. They're not thoughts that are related to your, quote, backstory. Mm -hmm. We don't walk around with our biographical identities kind of, you know, animating our words and our thinking. It's based on what you're hearing, what you're receiving from your partner, whether or not you're what you're getting from them and what you're trying to achieve yourself. So I, I, as I've gotten older, also Sanford Meisner's technique, I think, is much more rooted in that. It doesn't mean that when you're working on a scene, you don't have to find a way to kind of identify emotionally with the stakes of the scene. But and, and there are any number of different ways to do that. Some people sort of use it's uh, the famous Strasbourgian or Stanislavski and as if it's as if in my life, such and such and such had happened. It's as if my wife was sick. It's as if my cat was dying. It's as if I just lost my job. And you sort of make the imaginative transfer. I, I, for whatever reason, I've always been, the word is risable. Like I, I've always been fairly um, risable. I, I, it doesn't take me a lot to, to commit to the emotional demands of the scene. So I just buy into the imaginative circumstances without much, much work needing to get done. Uh, actors have their own strengths and weaknesses. You know, um, I, I didn't go to a professional actors training program. I think there are aspects of, of, for instance, a British actor's craft, the, the range they might have with um, it, it, both in physical expressiveness, maybe in their dialect work. One thing I just always innately had was a strong ability to make an emotional connection to a text. Yeah, that's one of the things I've kind of observed over watching many, many years of Star Trek is kind of the responsiveness uh, between, you know, I'd say you and, and Robert Picardo, I felt like the most responsive and reactive in working with other scene partners. Mm. Um, and, and especially in the way that, you know, Phlox is a very empathetic character. I feel like the way that your character comes off as well, in all the interactions he has with the crew members, it's always typically very empathetic uh, and very, very good at responding, I guess. It's a real great back and forth. Uh, I mean, what, what do you oh, think about that? You. I appreciate that. I mean, that's nice to hear. And, and you know, again, it's sort of where I used to teach Meisner. Sanford Meisner was somebody who put a great amount of emphasis in in the the nature of how the moment arises from what's really happening based on what you're getting from your acting partner and that mm -hmm. idea of very active listening, engaged listening. You still have a sense of what you're trying to achieve. You have a sense of the stakes. You have a sense of the emotional weight of the moment. So you're not acting in, in neutral, but the nature of what you're actually getting in the moment is, is really triggering your behavior. Your, your behavior cannot be preordained. If actors start 
you know, either trying to 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 push emotion, an emotional state that manifests itself in a certain kind of behavior, or they quirk it up intentionally for effect, then they're in their heads. And you really just need to be extremely present with your acting partner. That was that that has always been. I have all sorts of what I consider to be deep technical deficiencies. And at my age, not having ever been an athlete, I know I don't have the physical stamina that some great actors who managed to just read an article about Harrison Ford the other day at 80 years old. He's still riding goddamn horses. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you, you couldn't get eight guys couldn't hoist me onto a horse right now. <laughs> So, you know, I'm very cognizant of what my skill what my skills and my deficiencies are. My my skill set was was pretty much based in the Meisner training I had. And Bob Picardo, I think, is a wonderful actor for similar reasons. And I always felt like the interactions, especially between you and Scott Bakula, it felt very very, very organic. And again, you know, considering that you're playing this Denobulan character, this alien being, and you're having these very human interactions that felt real. Uh, and again, I, I didn't really see that as much with like Gates McFadden, and this is not a knock to any other doctors because they all did wonderful jobs with their material. But I especially feel like something about Phlox, maybe it was just the era of when the storylines are taking place, but it felt just so much more cemented in realism. And uh, and again, that responsiveness too, I think, especially with you and Scott back, though, it felt like a lot of just real magic back and forth there. That felt like oh, well, I'm eavesdropping. It. it, it, you know, it's funny. I mean, I, I think I also benefited one. I, I don't write the episodes. So, you know, the instances where I took exception, I took exception to the writing. 90% of the time, I felt like they gave me a lot of fun material and they and they created my ability to kind of lean in very like, ooh, can I watch them have sex? Oh, let me eat that food. Oh, Captain, talk to me, talk to me. I mean, that's that's there for you to play because they give it to you. And I was lucky in that respect. And also as the alien, I mean, on the ship you know the 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 trap of vulcans is that you know one we all have a strong and i think jolene did a great job but jolene is not and the, and the vulcans no longer really are the repository of of curiosity about other species because we know the vulcans as well as we know the humans now you had to have in a way a different kind of alien who could kind of lean in and go ooh that you could be curious about too, because he was unusual. So that, even though I didn't have as much screen time as other people, I do feel like I sort of had an odd leg up in terms of the nature of the role and what the role allowed me to get to play. I'm happy you mentioned Jolene also, because just again, rewatching recently to prep for this episode, you know, just seeing her portrayal of a Vulcan, it's such a, a more nuanced portrayal than I feel like we see throughout all of Star Trek. And uh, I love also watching your two interactions as well. You know, the two aliens on the ship, uh, really also just playing with each other's alienisms as well, if you will. Uh, the different yeah. manners and different behaviors you guys have. It's a real pleasure watching you guys on screen. I loved working with it. I mean, I loved working with everybody on that on that show, you know. I mean, it, it's it's like all things, you know, the nature of television is such that you have good episodes and bad episodes. I mean, you got to churn one out every week, every week, every week, every week, every week. And, you know, under a tight deadline, sometimes you kind of get thrown up your hands and saying, okay, that's the script this week, whether we like it or not. Sometimes I sort of thought Enterprise um, suffered from from a little bit of, oh, God, we've done that before. Oh, we've done that before. We've done that before. I, I, well, let's just do it anyway. We'll do it again anyway. We'll just change it slightly. Which is why I think sometimes the fans were a little quicker to dismiss Enterprise because they felt it had been a little, it was a little more rehashed. But when we hit on all cylinders, I thought the cast was actually quite wonderful and and adept at being able to to ground the stories in in realistic human behavior in, in ways that i really appreciated episodes to me like similitude i think is one of my favorite episodes uh, um I, I thought that was an episode one it was a wonderful episode for connor and jolene because it was the episode that really kind of allowed them to truly fall in love yeah but it did it in a very interesting way because it wasn't actually trip who who <laughs> actually really touched jolene's heart it was cloned trip and everybody on that episode kind of had the opportunity to 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 be deeply human in the way they related to the the ersatz trip and at the same time the show didn't lose its sense of urgency because the mission had to continue and we had no choice we got to kill this guy yeah um that to me was star trek at its best the stakes are high the the emotional reality circulates through all the characters everybody gets a little time and um, it actually does touch on uh, on an interesting scientific and ethical issue at the same time. Yeah, it's actually on my list of questions. In fact, I want to talk about similitude because I got to rewatch that one as well. And oh, my God, that's like one of the best 
of Enterprise. I, I thought episode. it was too. I thought it was too. I thought I thought a lot of the. I, I, I think a couple of things, and this is no rap on on Rick and Brandon, as I've often said. You know, one, they were lovely to me, and, and they were responsible for years and years and years of of great Star Trek. They were not given much of a chance to take a breather before they were asked to take up the cudgel again with Enterprise. And consequently, I think that they maybe didn't have as much of a of a cogitative space mm. to think about the Bible for the show. When Manny Cotto was brought in in the third season, one, he loved Star Trek. He realized that a lot of the 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 you know freedom he had for a show that was probably not going to last much longer, he got to write, particularly in the final season, some real valentines to Star Trek history. And, and I think he just brought a a, um, um, a a point of view and an animating impulse that we needed. And I thought a lot of the last two years, it was like, unfortunately, you know, a little too late to get our audience back. But I thought a lot of the last two seasons of, of Star Trek, we were hitting more often than we were missing. I would absolutely agree. It's such a different show. Like you guys definitely figure out where you wanted to be, what you wanted to do, where you wanted to go at that point. But, uh, you know, on the topic with, of... Simil- with, with one exception to me, which is I did... I did take a certain amount of exception to the nature of what the politics of Zindi pursuit meant during the post 9-11 years. Um, yeah. Individual episodes, nonetheless, really benefited from that impulse, that urgency. I just, you know, the, the Zindi thing kind of rankled a little bit. But I feel like those moments, especially when we get into that part of Enterprise, it becomes a lot more recurrent than other Enterprise, than other Star Treks have been, because typically it has been just those big overarching uh, moral stories that... It can be very ambiguous, but you're right. I mean, when Enterprise started doing what they were doing, I mean, it's very clearly this is post 9-11 America. This is our our analogy to it in Star Trek world. Yeah, and and although when the Zindi, when the Zindi episodes were resol- resolved, as was pointed out to me recently, and I'd forgotten about this, it turned out that the um, you know various uh, 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 buggy creatures mm-hmm. were actually themselves being manipulated, and you could read into that if you're of a political mindset, what um, what the critique really was, was a perhaps a critique of, of those uh, forces that, that use um, our speciesism, racism, culturalism, us against the other to manipulate us. When it, when it premiered, when the third season premiered, it, it was hard not to kind of feel for me a little bit like, I, you know... Post 9-11, here we are, the evil bugs have, have attacked us and 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 all all bets are off. Anything goes, let's go fucking destroy them. Right as we're trying to decide whether to invade Iraq, it's like, I don't like this voice. And I, I'm extremely political, as those of those of you who are watching may know, and I tend not to, you know, hide my light under a bushel. For me, one of the great post-9-11 mistakes was to confuse justice with vengeance mm. and uh, and when i consider what happened and i think when we all consider what happened after 20 plus years of occupying afghanistan and all the years and treasure um spent in iraq and the horrible results of that fiasco i i i, I there's a, always that little part of me with the zindi episodes that thought mm-hmm. Yeah, I wanted to actually ask you sort of a similar thing about that, which was if you'd ever had any episodes on Enterprise that had a topic that maybe hit too close to home for you. I mean, would you say that was the one or was there something else that maybe was a little bit closer for you? There was an episode. And again, I love Manny. And I think Manny's a wonderful writer. Um, and I did 24. I mean, none of us are pure. I ain't pure. You know, I mean, I've done Fox shows, even though I, I you know, like you know, against Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> You live in a you live in this culture, and you know no one's unsullied. There was an episode where I felt that to me Manny was kind of justifying torture, and that's the episode where Scott Bakula is prepared to say, you know, I'm going to push you, alien captain, out of the fucking airlock if you don't give me the information I need. And in that sense, this the ends justify the means philosophy. I I think you know again this is against a cultural backdrop of the grab black box renditioning waterboarding to me if you if you become that which you say is vile then where is the moral distinction and and we as a country were condoning torture and and i i felt like we we put an episode on that on one level condoned torture that Mm -hmm. that was the episode that to me was like 
Now, you know, people's perceptions are very different. And 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 it wasn't as if to Paul in that episode said, you cannot do this. So it wasn't as if both sides of this were not presented. But the captain is usually ultimately viewed as the final repository of, of moral goodness in the Star Trek world. So when the show kind of leans towards the captain's point of view in the end, as, as you know, I think it does almost inevitably, it's hard not to feel like, you know, that was that was where we came down on the subject. I mean, Star Trek has always been a very political thing. And, you know, even as a kid, I, and I think I've spoken to a lot of folks who don't agree with me on this, but I always felt like uh, watching DS9 the very first time, I was like, is this meant to be like the Middle East crisis? Like for something, some reason in my head, I felt like that's what it was. And uh, seeing Enterprise as well, first time I'm like, you know, is Scott Bakula, his version of Captain Archer, is this meant to be like an analog to Bush if Bush was in Starfleet times? I mean, did you feel like that at all? Only at times during the third season mm. and, and and not all the time, um, you know. But at times, I, I didn't disagree that it was valuable to have a third season that had more uh, tension and more impulse. I thought it was very smart and astute to come up with a, a you know, a crisis. And plain devil's advocate, given that 9-11 had occurred, it made perfect sense to say, hey, you know, if we're going to do something on our show that's about, you know, propulsion, we better come up with something that has, you know, some fucking, you know, stakes in a way that resonates for an audience. So I get all the thinking behind it. Um, and, and candidly, I would also have to go back and watch the whole third season again before I, I you know, um, truly began to fulminate because my perceptions could be skewed. I haven't seen the third season in years. I'm just reporting my memory of what I felt at the time. Sure, sure. And it didn't, it didn't, you know, look, I, I, I didn't go in and throw the gauntlet down. I, I mean, I'm, who the fuck am I? I'm not saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm on strike. I'm not going to appear in this episode. It just, I found that there were moments in the third season that, that I considered to be problematic. Well, on a uh, less serious note, I bet we jump into a different area for a bit here. Uh, this is definitely a different area. I want to talk about the food on Enterprise because uh, I've heard stories about the food made by well, the late Darth Vader. Yes, well, right, right? segwayed. Yes, sir. Absolutely none there whatsoever, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I've heard so many good things about her food. Uh, I've seen like bloopers, uh, outtakes of the stars forgetting their lines because the food was so great. So uh, I'd love to hear any stories you have about Dorothy's food. Uh, well, you know, it's oddly, I, I, have, I have sort of a bifurcated response because um, I, I was the guy who loved to eat on the show. I was always wanting to eat different shit. I also, as an actor, if you commit to eating, you're fucked mm. because you got to match. You know, if you got a big old bite of turkey, like, you know, in the master, then, you know, on your close ups. One, it's hard to articulate. Uh, two, you, there's a certain urgency to a scene, even a scene that's a little more, you know, relaxed. Um, so I always tried to kind of like, you know, play the scene like, well, you know, you know, I'd always stop just short of having a bite. So I, I was served a lot of amazing food. Hardly any of it did I ever eat. <laughs> and she'd always ask me, it's like, you know, what do you eat? What do you not eat? It's like, you know, I don't care because I'm probably not going to eat it. If I can avoid <laughs> it. There were some scenes when I had no choice. And and, and yes, it was always good. But uh, uh, note to young actors watching in any food eating scene, don't eat the food. You can get away with it. Don't eat the food. Yeah, because who knows how long it's been sitting out also. No, no, no. Just just for the just to make sure that the scene, the rhythm of the scene is not dictated by the fact you're having to fucking eat. Mm, very true. It, it's really it's mostly about it, it's funnier and more interesting to me to play a scene in which you're always about to eat, but you keep getting interrupted or which you've got it poised on your fork the whole time, but you're so intense on what you're doing that you never really can quite be bothered to get it into your mouth or you're just finishing the meal. So that your last bite is like mm, register of satisfaction, anything you can do to play something other than having to digest on camera. That is a great tip actually. Huh? And uh, I have no segue for this question either. I'm just going to toss it your way here, but I want to talk about uh, the episode doctor's orders. And uh, really, besides the fact that we see Flox's bare feet, which are certainly suitable for like a Hobbit's OnlyFans page, uh, I do want to get to Naked Flox because, uh, yeah, Naked first time Flox. watching it, I'm like, wow, OK, that's unexpected. Yes. Um, there's got to be some stories there. So Naked Flox on set. How's that going for you? Well, for one thing, I don't know if this is true, but this is a story I've been telling for years because it amuses me. Early on, I think it was the second season, maybe it was even in the first season, there was a writer, Chris Black, and I was in a at a party with him. I think it was at Brandon's house 
And uh, I was making fun of the fact that everybody in the show runs around in their undie pants. When am I going to get to run, run around in my undie pants? And he said, well, you know, maybe Zenobians, maybe you don't run around in your undie pants. Maybe you just run around in your all together. And I said, fine, bring it on, motherfucker. And, you know, it's like tick tock, tick tock. Uh, Chris leaves the show. I thought, oh, well, that's that. Then third season, there I am running around in the all together. I thought, is that the legacy of Chris Black? Did he did he leave that note for them in the office? I'm leaving, but Billingsley has to be naked before this show is over. I suggested that when I walk into the room, when I walk into sickbay, I turn sharply to the left and all the way across the room, a flower pot falls to the ground. <laughs> they said no. They always they always kiboshed my great ideas, which were usually prurient or filthy or somehow problematic. But Picardo, as I've often said, he could just waltz into their offices and say, I want to be an opera singer. I want to have a love affair with Seven of Nine. And they go, oh, yes, Bob, anything you say, Bob. Me? Huh. I had an idea. I'm telling all the stories I always tell. People who watch me must get sick to death. Can't you get better stories, Billingsley? <laughs> there was an idea I had which is that we pick up a Denobulan ship in distress and we bring all the Denobulans on board and they're all like Oscar Madison. They just like leave their dirty dishes around. They leave their dirty underpants around. They don't bathe. They smell. They have cigars sex. everywhere. Look, yeah, it's like, ah, but they all look like me. <laughs> that was my pitch. Uh, that went nowhere. Like, what if the Denobulans all look the same? What if they all just look like me? Then I would put a marker down that no matter what happens years from now, no matter what show they do, if they cast a Denobulan, they have to cast me. And would you have just played all the parts by yourself then? Would that, that have been like the goal maybe? Yeah, yeah. That would have been a tour de force. It would have gotten an Emmy nomination. <laughs> yeah. And right. especially if they were all naked, maybe you would, yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. They didn't. They, they basically, they started locking the door. I had to slip my ideas under like the door and then they'd come back out again like the guy on the <laughs> other side. I was like, no. Like, geez. Man. The doors were allergic to paper, right? Just seems spitting them right out. Yeah, I know. Man, all right, fine. Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is sponsored by Triple Fiction Productions. Celebrating 15 years in business in 2023, TFP creates 3D printed Star Trek and sci-fi inspired items that fit into any collection. Whether you're a cosplayer who wants a Starfleet phaser, Bajoran tricorder, or a Klingon dagger, or a toy collector looking for that special accessory or diorama to make your figures truly stand out, Triple Fiction Productions has exactly what you need. And for you figure fanatics, that includes products that are the perfect size for Galoob, Mego, Playmates, and everything in between. All products are 3D printed in the US, with new designs constantly being updated on their website. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free which is a great way to save money as you build your collection. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free, which is a great way to save money as you build your collection. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free, where the more you order, the more discounts you receive. TFP also has a pay what you want section where clearance or misprinted items are available at a discounted price. Best of all, every product can be shipped worldwide. As a special bonus for listeners of this show, Trek Untold has a special discount code just for you. Enter UNTOLD10 at checkout for 10% off of all orders with no minimum purchase required. That's 10% off using UNTOLD10. To see all of their products, head to triple-fictionproductions.net. Or to stay up to date on their newest products, find them on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Triple Fiction Productions, where something is only impossible until it happens. Are you looking for the perfect fashion statement to show you're a geek and proud of it? Well, welcome to Geek Girls Castle, where I make fun and functional geeky clothing and accessories for every occasion. My name is Missy, and I started creating my own gear and apparel in 2015 to bring nerdy products to the geek girl population, which does include all LGBTQA+, non-binary, and POC and BIPOC folks. I couldn't find anything for us gals except t-shirts, so I decided to combine my passion for fashion with my fandoms, ranging from handmade skirts with really large pockets, travel accessories like toiletry bags, luggage tags, and zippered pouches. I also embroider nerdy items for home decor like wall hangings and hand towels, and products like keychains, bookmarks, and journal covers. Need something to carry all that in? Well, I make great bags to put all those accessories into or onto. Whether you like Star Trek, Star Wars, Doctor Who, Marvel, DC, and everything else in between, there is something for every geek girl. 
My website is constantly updated with new styles and fandoms, no matter what time or dimension you come from. If you'd like to browse my products or ask for something custom, visit me at geekgirlscastle.com. That's geekgirlscastle.com. All right, so John, I put notice out there on social media, as I mentioned earlier, that I was talking to you and I got tons of fan questions here. And I, I know you said we've, we've kind of uh, rehashed a few stories you've told on all sorts of different other podcasts, other conventions. We're going to see if we can crack the shell and get some new stuff here. Good luck. I know, I've right? I'm, for, I've been doing this for 20 years. I challenge you. You're a pro. You. <laughs> I'm swimming upstream today, John. You. <laughs> well, I got one here from Molly Jackson, and this all one right, goes Molly. back to acting technique here. So she had heard Garrett Wong talk in an interview about how on Star Trek, the human actors were told to downplay their emotions so that the aliens could be more alien. Were you ever given any directions like that? No. No, I mean, I'm not disputing that that could be. But I, I, to my knowledge, that had that that was never no one ever said anything to anybody about any, you know, grand sweeping, um, you know, um, um, methodology by which they should act or perform. I never heard anything like that. All right. Well, how about this one here from uh, Will Orr? And Will wants to know, uh, Dr. Flox's character was gregarious by nature and enjoyed being in large crowds with lots of people. So do you share that in common with Dr. Flox? And if so, how did you cope during lockdown of the pandemic? And how do you think Flox would have behaved? Uh, well, oddly enough, what always sort of struck me as interesting about the nature of the way they portrayed Flox is that while he came from a planet with, uh, where, you know, gajillion people, he actually did not like to be touched. Yep. Denobi Lin's had very, very odd and rigid and somewhat interesting rules about physical contact. They did not kiss. They did not believe in public displays of emotion. Their sexual habits sounded like, you know, they were hyper uh, elaborated. Um, so, yes, they were very social creatures, but they were not necessarily tactile creatures, oddly. Or if they were, it was within a surprisingly um, rigid uh, set of social boundaries. I always thought that was very unusual. Um, in, in terms of the, the socialization, uh, personally, I, I, you know, uh, one, the a miracle of zoom, mm -hmm. um, certainly missed a lot of my pals getting to fraternize with them, uh, in person. And I am, yes, very much like Flox in that respect. In fact, I'm having a wonderful Christmas because we're going out and seeing everybody right now. Um, but, uh, I'm very happily married. And that is, you know, she's my wife is the most important person in my life. So even during lockdown, although I had the same frustrations as everybody did, that, you know, you're feeling like some wonderful aspects of the texture of life have gone away. The heart and soul of my life is my partner. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was very lucky in that respect. Uh, Phlox, I imagine, would probably have, you know, uh, as you can see, my my biggest love is reading. And I'm I'm sure that um, outside of my wife, outside of my wife, <laughs> know where she can be lurking um i'm sure flox would have uh, found ways to say in this situation under these circumstances i turn that part of my brain that is delighted in doing other things that are slightly more monastic in nature in that direction and, and that's so much about what life is is you know you grow older life throws you all sorts of curveballs and in the end you have to find ways to enjoy what life allows you instead of mourning that which life does not allow you. I, I don't have the career that I once had or that I might have at one point in my life wished to have had. So I do other things instead. And I do those things which as, with as much uh, a joy as, as I did when I was acting. I, I now put much more of my time in my life into social service work. And that's, you know, what I think one has to do as one lives one's life. It's one of the things I loved about Phlox. You know, I I play any number of like serial killers and child molesters and lunatics and, you know, frankly, disagreeable people. <laughs> Dr. Phlox was like the one time in my career where I got to play somebody who I actually am like. So, <laughs> you know, um, which may be why people like that role i i it's odd because I, I you know looking back i didn't realize at the time what a gift it was for me to play somebody who had you know such an agreeable nature and even hearing that response it's like i'm trying to figure out if it's actually john telling me that or if it's flox telling me that because it feels like that's the thing he would say i i, I you know yeah i mean and again it's, it's not like i've watched the shows in a long 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 time and i don't know how cognizant i even was at the time but with the passage of time 
and particularly because I have always really loved, candidly, have really loved the the nature of what Trek has allowed me to do, to have kind of a public persona in relationship to the fans. I love the conventions. I always do podcasts. I'm always happy to chat with people, in part because I realized that Phlox was a gift that keeps on giving, because I do really believe in his philosophy. I I, I ac- absolutely adore what he stands for. You know, I, I really respect the fact that this is a guy who, you know, again, to me was like, I'm going to go off on this space mission with a bunch of people from species. I don't know from Adam and probably I'm not going to come back alive, but what a chance to have a blast and, and, and let's do it because life is short and it should be an adventure and it should be about, you know, about curiosity. Um was one other thing that was interesting to me about the show. So, so, to a certain extent, to be honest with you, I kind of think the show could have gone a little further in this direction. As the first ship, the weapons explode. We don't trust the transporter. What do we do? We just met a hostile species. Do we go? Do we run? Do we stop? Do we talk? Do we fight? Ah, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? I kind of wish they'd gone a little bit further in the direction of some of the, the emotional chaos of that. You know, if there was anything that I always kind of not objected to, but wanted to argue with Star Trek about. You know the movies of Robert Altman? Yes. I, I kind of wanted a little bit. Can we have overlapping dialogue? Can we have some of the cluster fuckedness of what it would be like when nobody actually agrees on what to do, but the clock is ticking? I thought our show maybe could have broken some of the um, uh, stylistic verites of Star Trek. You know, it, it started to do it insofar as the design of the ship was very, you know, it was like a submarine. It felt much more, you know, tight and narrow and constricted and cramped. I was a guy who leached people instead of, you know, <laughs> sticking it with a hypo spray. I would have liked to have seen the show go a little further in that direction. And I thought it unfortunately bent back to being a little bit more standard issue track where, you know, meh, you have cancer. Meh, I've cured you. We take the that we'll take the shuttle pod down and we'll, you know, beam. it all became a little bit too um, e- e- easy in a way, mm-hmm. in my opinion. It definitely would have been interesting. That's a great point. I mean, I've never really looked at it in that way before. And the fact that, yeah, like people don't really talk over each other, even when they're having arguments or conflicts, you rarely kind of see that. It's all very much just such structured type of writing. Yeah. And it's, and it's, and it's just, you know, it's interesting because it's just, it's, and hey, you don't argue with success. I mean, what we were the fourth iteration of Star Trek from Next Gen, not counting the original series. And, uh, who am I to say that, um, you know, maybe you should mix it up more. Some of why I don't think our show survived more than four seasons is because we were on UPN itself, a dying network. I don't think there was that much that they could have done differently. And yet, and yet, it's not, I think, wrong to say our premiere attracted an audience of 10 to 12, 12 million. The second episode attracted about 2 million. Something didn't resonate for people. I could be completely wrong about what that is. Um, and I've talked to a lot of different people who have different opinions about what that is. In, in my opinion, one of the things that I would have liked to have seen is, 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 uh, you know, a, a greater, a greater stylistic shift away in every respect. When you're flipping the channels, you know, in a, in a, in a millisecond, your brain registers that you've landed on a Star Trek show because it's lit the same way. It's designed the same way. There, there's so much about it that's just like you know canon um some of the shows now you know mix that up a little bit more this next question actually works out really well because we're going to basically expand on a little bit of what you're talking about with that previous question uh, Rafael uh, faria on instagram wants to know in what way do you identify with the character of flocks and uh, also a little bit more fun here uh what do you think about polygamy in the star trek cultural context <laughs> Um, as any man who's ever married would tell you, it's like polygamy. Yes, yeah, dangerous know. territory here, Raphael. I can barely do one wife. <laughs> first question first. I think uh, in terms of what resonates for me with Dr. Flox, as I mentioned, I think, you know, his adventurous spirit, his curiosity, his passion for experience, his desire to poke his nose into shit, um, his, his uh, um, obvious uh, a, a wide array of interests. And there was one episode, for instance, late in this, late in the, in the, I think this was late third season, maybe it was even fourth season, 
after the Zindi disaster, we go to Earth and and the flocks won't go down to the surface because he's afraid he's afraid that, you know, the xenophobia might be. That was a moment when I really wanted to go, no, 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 no. I don't think that flocks would have that reaction. Um, it, uh, not that I'm going to like, you know, going to parachute into a bar in the in the wilds of Baluchistan and just saunter in and say, hey, people, how you doing? How you Baluchis doing? Uh, I, I am not as brave as Dr. Flox, but I admire the spirit. No rap on the Baluchistanis. I'm, I'm just happy to be reading a book about Baluchistan. It just popped into my head. Fascinating culture. I didn't uh, even know that was a real place, so thank you for telling me that. <laughs> Yes, it spans Iran, Afghanistan, and uh, Pakistan. Uh, I'm, I'm just reading an amazing book called Ghost Wars, which is about the uh, American presence in Afghanistan from the beginning of the Russian invasion up until 9-11 by a guy named Steve Cole, C-O-L-L, which is a very, very interesting book. Um, anyway, as to uh, polygamy, uh, um, you know, if it put it this way, Polygamy, as is practiced in, say, Mormonism, seems to me to be um, uh, uh, not terribly feministic. If there was a culture that actually practiced polygamy in a feministic way, so, you know, it's like everybody in the pool together, and, and you know, any marriage arrangement that everybody could agree with is fine, that's, you know, let a hundred flowers bloom. As, as Chairman Mao said, I hate to quote Chairman Mao because he did kill a lot of people, but I do love let a hundred flowers bloom. I change it to let a thousand flowers bloom because a hundred doesn't seem like enough flowers to me. I mean, you basically made it your own. So now we can just credit that quote to you and not Mal. Yeah. yeah. Fuck you, Chairman Mal. Yeah. <laughs> Billingsley's taking it away from you. As you know, John so Billingsley said. <laughs> yeah, since we are sort of in, in a, your library space as well, too, uh, I'd like to hear this as a now a me question. Uh, what is the book that perhaps changed your perspective on the way you look at the world? I don't think of it that way. I think actually in a weird way, that's one of the things that I always sort of like roll my eyes about when people kind of like, you know, pound the Bible. It's a wonderful moment at the end of uh, Inherit the Wind when the character is a stand in for Clarence Darrow sort of slams the Bible and uh, Darwin's origin of the species together and suggests that, you know, both points of view have to be heard. Uh, books books are a, a a great passion of my life. And to me, it is the cumulative effect of a multiplicity of voices which is certainly the star trek argument that um mature you and that give you a sophisticated point of view i can't think of a single you know to say that there's a single book that changed my worldview would be to kind of deny to me what the true power of of, of books are there are books that i you know stay in my memory um, the Infinite Jest, which is kind of a love-hate book. If you happen to like David Foster Wallace, I think it's extraordinary. I can understand why people throw it across the room very early because one is extremely dense and two, it's not exactly plot-driven, although it's got, you know, enormous um, plot strands. But it's one of the best books I've ever read about the uh, human, about addiction, about the nature of addiction, how we all are addicts. We're info, infotainment addicts, we're... we're you know, obviously we're drug addicts and booze addicts and, and painkiller addicts. But his fundamental argument is we become addicted to the things that take us away from from a, a, a deep dive into what it means to be, you know, inhabiting our own tormented bodies. We're, we're escaping from our souls. And I thought that was quite a lovely, although funny and dense exploration of what it is to be in flight from ourselves. Now, one of my Patreon supporters, uh, Shalom Breasticker, wants to know. Uh, Wait, say that name again. What a great name that is. <laughs> I, I hope I'm saying it right, Shalom. I, I'm not I'm so sorry. I, I, I don't know. But I, I, I hope it's Breasticker or Breasticker. I don't know if the right way. I'm so sorry, Shalom. But uh, thank you for the question. <laughs> I tell you, I. I... But yeah, he wants to know. Uh, Doctor Flox has a very wide smile, and it looks too wide to be natural. And uh, it me is inserting here, I, I assume he's probably talking about the computer-generated smile, which is like that super long one that you do, but. You do have a pretty distinct. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's the face right there. I, I think he's probably talking about that. I, I don't know why I happen to have this handy, but I just happened to have it handy. Uh, it was really completely coincidental. That's a digital effect. It costs ten thousand grand, <laughs> and that's why you don't see it very often. Because once the ratings began to plummet, nobody wanted to spend ten thousand dollars on the doctor's puss. Yeah, uh, but you know, I did want to note since you know watching the show again, uh, you do have a pretty wide smile on that show. And you have a very distinct smile. I don't know how much that is the makeup, how much of that is you. I mean, was that something that you did for the character or is that just basically John showing up on, on screen? 
Well, I think to a certain extent when it's, you know, even though the digital smile was not used again, you, you know, you, you start from the premise that this guy is amused by so much. I mean, he's just, a, he walks around amused a lot, which uh, is, a, is a trait I share with him. I, I think I think life is, is rich in, in Chekhovian comedy. Um, so for me, there's a sense that even when things are ridiculous, disastrous, painful, there's a part of me that just has to laugh at the comedy of the of the human tragedy or the tragedy of the human comedy i think flocks had kind of that similar bent so yeah i think he is smiling a lot it's like oh, humans <laughs> yeah we're all gonna die but oh dear heavens humans <laughs> well i got a very important one right now this is from my mom in fact because she's uh following me on instagram too so hi mom wow this is from uh, from Barbara, and she would like to know about your time on Stargate SG-1, which, to be honest, I always ask about because of her. So she specifically demanded I ask you this question uh, since she's a giant Richard Dean Anderson fan. So she would love to hear any stories you have about working with Mr. RDA. Uh, and not just that, but also what you thought about the character and Dr. Felger getting to basically essentially be a Trek nerd, too. Uh, well, the fun thing about that, one, I, I, and, I, and I'm not sure if this is true. I think it's true. When I was on Star Trek, I was number seven on the call sheet. So I had episodes. I didn't have that much to do. And they very graciously, in fact, I had a little song, which I always like to sing, called Day Off. Day off, day off, six days off and the checks still come. I used to sing it for the other actors to irritate them. The producers let me double dip. I went off and angled for work elsewhere and i got offered this gig on uh on stargate and uh so th yeah they were clearly thinking it would be fun to have somebody who's on star trek come in and be the character that's like you know star trek um so the nice thing was as opposed to on star trek where every word is precious you know i mean you drop a the or a but or a though and it's like cut 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 i'll do it again Stargate was like, you know, here's a script, but if you've got better ideas. <laughs> and I do think that, um, although I didn't really have a chance to work with him very closely, I do think some of that uh, was was a spirit infused by Richard Dean Anderson, who had a very kind of, a, I think, a, an understanding of the playful nature of the show and a desire to, to help create a show that was uh, 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 self-conscious in that regard that knew, that was in on its own joke so the guy i got to work with patrick mckinnon who was a wonderful canadian comedian uh famous for uh his uh, uh turns on the red black show specifically red black red green red green red green yeah i didn't know of him but i adored working with him i i just had so much fun with him and, and and everybody else was sweet too, but most of my time was with Patrick. Just you know, the two of us kind of bumbling around the ship, and you know, making you know, like don't shoot me, Jesus Christ, you know, put that gun down. Oh, I only want to It was like getting to play Laurel and Hardy, um, and I loved it. They brought him back, <laughs> but they didn't bring me back. So crimes against humanity. I know. So, you know, from having this be a wonderful experience, it went into being the worst experience of my life. Lousy Stargate. Bastards. I know. Richard Dean Anderson also had it written into his contract, um, which, you know, you're a star. I don't think he had to work like, you know, Wednesday, Thursday or Friday or Thursday. I mean, anyway, he and he had a private plane. So, you know, he'd shoot all of his shit out by midweek and then he kind of you know, fly off to back to the States, you know, wave goodbye. It's like, you know, at the end of MASH, they're waving goodbye to the, you know, the Koreans still left on the ground in Korea. And they, bye, da, 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 bye, Richard. So it did mean that, you know, um, the days when he worked, they were long days. Yeah. Um, so we had some long days with Richard. But then the days when Richard was gone, there was a general sense of like, you know, dad's gone. <laughs> so it was a sportive set, as I recall. Well, on the note of other things that aren't Star Trek 2, we got one from Philip Watson here, and he has a good one, I think. I don't know if you talked about this one too much. Okay. Uh, he wants to hear about working with Denzel Washington on the massively underrated film Out of Time. And I love a good Denzel story in this show, too. He seems like a genuinely good guy. So, I mean, is he really... That way, I mean, what, what's it like to be with Denzel? <laughs> uh, um, so, again, that was a film I got to shoot while I was on 
uh, Star Trek. And again, they were extremely gracious to me and they let me bop back and forth. Um, here's a funny story about that movie. That that <laughs> Carl Franklin and uh, Denzel worked together on Devil uh, in a Blue Dress. And uh, it, Don Cheadle was also in that movie. Uh, Denzel thought that uh, uh, Don Cheadle had been had been lauded in part by um, Carl at his expense. So when they came when it came time to working on another movie together, Denzel had had you know a, approval who you cast, and he turned down every name actor that was going to play his sidekick, and I was the only guy left standing because I was a nobody. The only reason I got that part was because Denzel didn't want to be, as Carl Franklin put it, Don Cheadled again. Mm. <laughs> so um, uh, I always I always have sort of, you know, a, an ironic appreciation. It's like, thank you, Denzel. I would not have gotten this part if not for you. But the reason I got it is because in your eyes, I was dog poo. So go figure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Amazing to work with, obviously. I mean, you know, an incredible to our conversation earlier, an incredibly um, a present actor in the moment. You know, he's very, very, uh, he's a very kinetic, electric, physical actor, and he's very keyed in in the scene. And so they let us improv, and I like that. I like to have that level of playfulness in the scene, and it was great when the camera was rolling. It was great. And Carl Franklin is a fabulous director. And I would agree with your question. I thought that was a very underrated, you know, B, pulp movie, but done with great style and panache. And I loved working with everybody in it and the ladies as well. Unfortunately, they released it in the fall, which is kind of, as anybody who follows the American movies knows, is now the death season. If it ain't a summer blockbuster and it ain't a prestige Oscar picture, which comes out in December, uh, it ain't nothing in American cinema. And that movie consequently disappeared. Ouch. Well, I'm not I, even thought, I, thought, I thought that movie because I got actually a fair amount of attention for it. I thought that movie was going to actually kind of like take me from here to here. Mm-hmm. And it did. It, it, you know, and, you know, consequently, I've never really had a film career. I, I've done a lot of television, but, but, you know, although I've maybe done 30 or 40 films, most of them have been, you know, like, what, what was that film? It's like, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that was, that was one of those, those, those times in an actor's career, which happens to so many of us when it's like, you, you've got the brass ring, it's in your finger and it just, and it goes around and you realize, oh, I just lost my finger. That's a good analogy. But I mean, to be fair, the upside is, you know, there's other Star Trek actors that didn't have the opportunity to go on other shows. I mean, that's one of the reasons why Terry Farrell ended up leaving Deep Space Nine was due to that kind of thing. It was the first couple of years and, and to a certain extent, um, you know, one, I kind of felt like I might have <laughs> shot my wad on out of time because they really bent over backwards to accommodate me. I mean, I was flying back and forth to Miami and, uh, you know, flying out in the middle of an episode and coming back to complete the episode. And I didn't want to push my luck. So I, I didn't I didn't necessarily do quite as much uh, outside of the show in seasons three or four. Um, I, I as the guy who wore the rubber head. I got to say, when the show was canceled, I might have been the only person who had 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 decidedly mixed emotions. I think everybody else was very upset. One, we we all knew it was coming. I certainly knew it was coming. It was like it was a miracle we made four seasons. But when the word came down, we weren't coming back. It was a little bit like, well, that's a shame. <laughs> you know, two and a half hours to put on, 45 minutes to take off those contact lenses, which hurt your eyes. I really liked the guy and I liked my fellow actors and it was, I really love being part of the franchise. I'm never going to wear a rubber head again. <laughs> Fair and enough. I, I don't think I, I could do it either. I didn't have it as bad as some people. I mean, you know, it's like, God forbid you're a Borg. Oh you yeah. Know? Or Armin with those teeth. Oy. And we just had on the show, uh, you may remember him as well. Uh, Scott McDonald, who was uh, commander Dolom in enterprise. He was telling us about being all, all the different characters he played Dolom being one of the rougher ones, but He's telling me about when he did Tosk on D Space Nine. That was like six hour makeup each time. Yeah, no way. No, thank you. I knew, I knew Scott from Seattle. He used to live in Seattle, and uh, we were both actors. Although our paths really never crossed professionally uh, up there. Um, he did a lot of great yeah. theater work I think, in Seattle, if I remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had a theater company in Seattle for many years, which is still around, called Book It, which adapts fiction for the stage. 
started as short form adaption, short stories verbatim, and then moved into longer form adapt adaptation, where you actually are taking a novel and finding a way to turn it into a into an abbreviated version of itself as a play. Mm. Um, but you know, unfortunately, you can't make a living in the theater. No. <laughs> Well, it's kind of fun, though, because Scott brought this up and I've had other guests bring it up as well who are from the world of theater. And they say that especially uh, Star, Star Trek itself, it's like so theatrical and especially show uh, so Shakespearean. I'm like I'm like smashing show and so together because of Shakespeare. But uh, it, it's very Shakespearean, very theatrical kind of acting experience. And did you feel the same way once you started to get on that bridge of the Enterprise? You know, it's funny because I hear that a lot. Uh, and I, and it's certainly true that and I suppose it is true that it, it always helps to have a theater background. I mean, it just helps to have a theater background no matter what you do. If you have a theater background, you you are, you know, I think going to be that much more um, adroit when it comes to taking a scene apart and analyzing it quickly and figuring out what the actions and the intentions are and figuring out where the transitions are and figuring out how to button a scene in a way that has some, you know, emotional weight. There are just a lot of things you learn from a career on stage that, that, help feed your ability to work in other mediums i don't know that i necessarily agree that star trek is a particularly um um more fruitful place for stage actors or or you could only be on star trek really and succeed if you had a stage background i i i, I hear that a lot i've heard that a lot i i just don't know that in my experience i necessarily think that's true i suppose it is arguably true that if you've got a, a you know a, a face of prosthetics that that to play through the rubber you may have to justify some size and certainly if you're you know a klingon or some of the other more bellicose species it's written into the script that you've got a certain kind of you know rumbustiousness but generally speaking i i kind of feel like good acting on camera is nuanced acting mm -hmm. you no know, it's it's not you don't have to hit the back wall that's why i like it more than theater in the end george bernard shaw had a famous expression that the quality of the performance is rooted in the optics of the space and meaning that if you're performing in a three thousand foot you know three thousand seat auditorium and you're not miked you've got to justify in your choices a reason why you're talking in like this you know, every scene has to come from a place of, of size or you're not going to hear it in the back row. I love on camera acting because I don't have to think about that at all. Hmm. I'm just communicating the way I'm communicating with you. Sometimes I raise my voice, sometimes I lower my voice, but fundamentally, I do not have to think about the stylistic choices. I'm simply having a conversation. And I think that's true on any any television hmm. or show. show. I think that might be one of the reasons I personally like Flock so much is because uh, it, it doesn't feel like the person playing Flox is like making sure that he can, people in the back row can hear him. You know, it feels like he's much more reserved and pulled back and able to, because of that, be a little more of a, a human kind of character. Yeah, I mean, and that's maybe why I, I tend not to think in terms of, you know, w when I hear the word Shakespearean, I, I tend to, you know, w which uh, Armin Shimmerman, I'm sure if he was here, would like go, no, no, no. Because in the reality is that w when you when you when you are a Shakespearean actor, what you have the ability to do is is interpret an extraordinarily demanding text rich in linguistic challenges in a way that hits every single complicated thought in a way that makes it clear to the audience. That is not about size. That's about intelligence. And in that sense, I think, you know, um, a good a good actor um, is always a good Shakespearean actor because he can intelligently figure out how to bring a lot from a text. Well, far off in the left field, away from Shakespeare, I had a few different people here asking about this TV show. Uh, they wanted to hear about your time on The Orville. And uh, oh, yeah. you got to do that episode with Mr. Bob Picardo, who we've talked about a bunch today, and also Molly Hagen, who has been on this very podcast and uh, talked about working with you guys as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it seemed like it was a fun time. The stories I've heard so far had, were good things about it. You were wonderful in that role, too. It was a great episode. Uh, do you have any memories from working on that set? Well, one, I love I, I love Bob and I love Molly. And I also got to love the woman who played my wife, um, whose name is escaping me. And also mine, because I forgot to write it down. But I will put a little note here on the video version so people will know exactly who it was. I know one of your readers is good. One of your, one of your listeners is going to call in. She was fabulous. And so, so I, you know, the, the four of us, uh, old, old, crusty senior citizens, were, were, I think we all had a grand time together. Molly, who I had known um, from, 
from other shows. Uh, she'd actually played my wife on a short-lived show, uh, the name of which is Escaping Me, with Johnny Lee Miller a few years before. And um, it, at the time, I was also, I was a board president of the Hollywood Food Coalition, and everywhere I went, I was carrying around my business card. So I got to I got to fan my uh, my bit, various business cards out, including the, my uh, as I was involved in some other charitable pursuits. But I particularly focused on the Hollywood Food Coalition, and I cajoled Molly into joining our board. <laughs> <laughs> so the Orville always has a soft spot in my heart because from the Orville came uh, Molly's involvement, and although she's left our board, she was I integral to our growth and it was such a you know a meaningful addition for me to the team um love working with bob love sticking his hand in a hot, oh, spoiler alert spoiler alert in a pot of boiling soup um you know i i got to play the i got to play an unregenerate villain um my just desserts however in the end spoiler alert spoiler alert shot plumbus to death people ask me you're gonna come back from the orville it's like did you see the episode <laughs> Well, that's the beauty of prosthetics, John. You can always come back with a different alien, right? My shade might come back. My specter <laughs> might haunt you, I suppose. Um, I will say this. Seth MacFarlane supposedly does an amazing Dr. Phlox impersonation, and he was on the set every day. It was like, come on, I want to hear it. I want to hear it. And we would never do it. I don't know why. <laughs> like, come on. I could definitely see him being able to do it. He has like the, the kind of similar voice. I feel like he could pull that off. He can do, uh, he, uh, he's an amazing talent. He can imitate anything. So yes, I'm sure he could do it. I don't know why he, he suddenly, he gets, suddenly he gets shy. Seth MacFarlane gets shy with me. I don't know. My other, my other story though, that I also will tell Bob Picardo, they cast because he's Bob Picardo. Me, I get a call from my agent. Do you want to audition for the Orville? It's like, all right. Oh, I audition for the Orville. I, I, I suspect that it was like, you know, the tape crosses the desk. It's like, Oh, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, he played Dr. Flock. Sure, let's cast him. This reminds you in this business, out of sight, out of mind. It's not like anybody was thinking, here's a great idea. Fortuity. <laughs> but I knew that, which is why when, when I auditioned, it was like, all right, I'll work hard on this audition because it would be fun. But damn you, that is no offer. That's why you wore your F.U. Bob Ricardo shirt to the audition. No, I'm Bob's fault. <laughs> <laughs> But you kind of uh, alluded to some of these characters earlier, and since we are on the topic of villains, here, here's an actual segue. Uh, Todd Smits wants to know about your time as the serial killer George in two episodes of Cold Case, which okay. uh, I never, you know, I knew the show existed, never really watched it. It wasn't my type of show to watch, but I was able to find them. And like, you, you, again, another masterful performance, but yikes, you were like really creepy and scary. And it's a very complex character, too. Like, it's a great role for you. And just uh, you really reveled in being the serial killer, it feels like. I've been villains a lot. I've been, I was a, a serial killer on NYPD Blue. I was a, I was a very different kind of serial killer. That was more sort of like a blustering blue collar type cab driver who is a racist who kills a black fare and then decides that, you know, maybe he should just kill all his black fares. And I played a, a, a rapist who abducts like 13 year old girls and drags them into warehouses. I've been, uh, I've been, I've been a villain a lot a lot uh you know which always makes me laugh because i wouldn't hurt a fly i'm too scared the fly might have a family it's like oh, oh i'm sorry flies um yes george was uh <laughs> george uh his, his shtick was that he liked to um uh abduct people women you know take them out into the woods, make them strip to their underwear because this is network television, just to the underwear. They don't, they don't take anything more off. Make them run around in the woods until they, you know, eventually like, you know, collapsed. And then he would shoot them with his hunting rifle, which I thought was like, well, that is a rather strange conglomeration of, you know, of despicableness, but all right. So they catch him. And then he um, he he really fancies himself to be smarter than anybody else. So he takes great delight in having been caught because he knows they can't prove it. And that first episode was kind of fun because, you know, although there were standard issue television tropes that I always kind of roll my eyes about, such as after having proven in interrogation after interrogation that he's absolutely unflappable, she manages to find his one weakness and she gets him to almost crumble <laughs> because he can't control himself. And it's like, mm, yeah, all right. But nonetheless, I get away with it. And I was the only person in cold case that ever gets away with it. And I walk away and, you know, there's this very kind of poignant song playing as all the cops are like, you know, like ready to punch the walls because they see this horrible guy walking away. Well, they couldn't let me get away with it. So they bring me back. 
for the uh, finale. And long story short, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. This show was on like 20 years ago, so I'm yeah, not too yeah. um, I I basically uh, abduct the lead cop and we have this long tense tete-a-tete all of which ends with me essentially handing her my gun, roughly speaking, saying, go ahead and shoot me for no real fucking reason. Uh, so I thought it was kind of a, you know, mind you, I cashed a check, but I thought it was kind of a lame finale. Uh, however, that said, the woman who wrote those episodes, fabulous, fabulous writer, general speaking, I just didn't think she, unfortunately, she had to conform to certain aspects of network television. She went on, I think her name is Mina Sood to uh, do uh, the Americanized version uh, of a famous Scandinavian cop show. I think it's called The Killing, um, which was set in the Pacific Northwest, which is fabulous. I might be garbling the name. So anyway, it's probably more than you wanted to know about that show. Nice folks like that cast. No, yeah, not at all, though. I mean, it was very cool. I mean, I, I, having, again, being very unfamiliar with the show, watching it, um, it's pretty pretty good TV, I got to say, and I really like what you do with it. I mean, again, it's not like a mustache twirling, top hat wearing villain. Like, there's some actual complexity and nuance to this guy here. I, I appreciated that. No, well, good, 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 good. You know, I mean, there are, there are when, when you have a little more room to work with, you have a little more room to work with. Sometimes, you know, it's a scene or two and and that's all there is to play you know it, it really it's on the page or it's not on the page mm. i uh th this one no one ever asked about because no one's ever seen it i played there's a short-lived show called martial law and uh that was I, on my next questions actually because i always ask my guests about martial law because i watched that show <laughs> you did not you liar um i yeah, asked Armin sherman about it i have asked I, I can run down the list of folks i've asked about that show i love right. sam O'Hung. i watched that show to death you did. You really I watched did. Martial Law. Do you remember my part? I'd have to go back and watch it unfortunately because it's been a long time. I've, it's those are hard to find. Those episodes are hard okay. to find. But uh I played a corrupt food inspector and I go into restaurants and I let loose cockroaches and then I basically say, Oh, I'm gonna have to fine you for the cockroaches unless you pay me. So they caught up to me and and I'm sitting in my car eating a sandwich and they come up and the you know, the lead guy dumps a giant thing of cockroaches on my head. So they actually film that. It's like, you know, I get the job. It's like, oh, okay. You're dreading that day. So indeed, they dump a giant thing of cockroaches on my head. And, you know, everybody, every insect, every bug, every 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 living creature has its own wrangler. <laughs> so the cockroach wrangler is like, all right, don't move. Got to get all the cockroaches. And they come and they like, pick this one out, pick that one out. I'm just sitting there going, Jesus <laughs> fucking Christ. They get like 11 cockroaches, 12 cockroaches. Oh, we're, we're missing the 13th cockroach. Where's that 13th cockroach? Can I get out of the car? They finally they let me out of the car. And, you know, guess where that 13th cockroach has, has gotten? <laughs> like, I'll wrangle this one myself. <laughs> No one ever asked about martial law. But I, I, you know. I, I got to follow up now because, you know, I, I got to hear about working with Samo. Did you actually get a chance to, uh, I know he didn't speak any English, but I mean, did you get a chance to at least say hello in, in any way or interact with him in any way whatsoever? I probably did. My only memory of that, you'll be surprised too, uh, <laughs> is of the cockroach. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah there there are there are any number of shows where it's like, you know, you had one or two days and your memory is very limited to that that one particular some some particular incident or moment or interaction that kind of and the rest of it is a blur i did some show <laughs> jesus what was it i don't even remember jack and jill hmm. also short-lived and i was a doctor i, I had a scene in, in a hospital room with i think is it priscilla presley jamie presley jamie presley yeah I've gone on to have a great, wonderful career. She was not having a good day. <laughs> and she was like, not directed at me. But the director came in and said, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, you second rate hack. You blah, 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 blah. You're going to direct your way out of a paper bag. It's like, you know, if you're the guest star, it's like, I'm going to just, uh, oh, look at the set. It's very. <laughs> You're you're witness to a lot of um I lost my cat. You're witness to a lot of interesting behavior when you're a guest star, a, a co-star on somebody else's show. Um very, very hard sometimes. It's like going to a party. Mm. And you know, it's like it's a little bit like going like in that Aldi play, Who's Afraid of Virginia Wolf? Sometimes it's like, 
oh, I met Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf's party. Peak. <laughs> Sometimes not. Uh, Mark Harmon. I always say this about Mark because he and Scott Bakula are two people who, in my career, uh, you know, I think uh, exemplify what it means to be number one on the call sheet. Yeah. yeah. Classy, professional, always kind, knew everybody's name, went out of his way to introduce himself to the extras, to the stand-ins, yada, yada, yada. Just, you know, going to craft it. Anybody want anything? Um, quarterbacks. Mm. Uh, wonderful when you're on a show with a great quarterback. Can be tricky when you're on a show with somebody who hasn't quite taken on that, you know, that that kind of responsibility in a weird way. Well, I think your cat Boo went to protect your home from any cockroaches. So uh, thank you um, for, for that, Boo. He he hopped into a. He's got a secondary chair. <laughs> Actually, it's, there he is. That's the captain's chair. That's the captain's chair exactly. Well, you know, since we're talking about pets, I feel like this is a good segue for me to ask, uh, you know, because you did get to work with the true star of Enterprise a few times. You got to have a few scenes with Porthos. What's Porthos really like? Is he a good boy? Two girls. Uh, Secrets you know, out. Long dead. Um, twins. I could never tell them apart, so I didn't have, never knew which one I was working with. W.C. Fields' famous adage is, you know, dogs and children. <laughs> we didn't have any kids on the show, I'll say that. Um Although I did film a wonderful spot recently, which if you're going to watch Trek Talks 2, Will Wheaton's a guest. Uh, and we had a lovely conversation about, in part, him being the kid on that show. Um, he was a cheese eater. She was a cheese eater. So, you know, you, you kind of had to. So so there was some, some gassiness. <laughs> also true of Jolene, though. So, you know, it's all right. Something I wasn't used to. Um, dogs are not great at hitting the marks. And, you know, the other thing, unfortunately, is when you're doing any kind of a shot with a dog, it's really hard to keep the trainer either out of the shot or to keep the trainer's voice out of soundtrack. Mm. So, you know, you're whatever that whatever the scene might be, if there's a dog in it. You inevitably in the background, it's like, OK, okay sit, sit, sit. OK, no, sit, sit. It's like, could you could you shut up? Because I'm kind of trying to play the scene. I, I can't get the dog to sit if I don't say sit. It's like. That seems like something that the dog training union should have figured out. <laughs> um, and those of you out there who are in the dog training union, I love you all. For anybody I've offended in my conversation today, Jamie Presley, I'm so sorry. I know you're wonderful. You just had a bad day. Denzel, thank you for the job. I really appreciate it. Prince among princes. Anybody else? My wife, I was only teasing. Solomon, oh, boo. Our old cat used to be Solomon. Boo, your wonderful cat. And that covers everybody. Well, I got another obscure one here for you. Since we're going from martial law, let's keep going down this obscure path here. I have someone on Facebook named Ken Masterson. He believes he saw you in a series of anti-smoking PSAs yep. uh, as Chuck the Chain Smoker. That is true. He couldn't find any evidence that. That's a true thing that you did? True thing. Chuck the Chain Smoker. Yeah. Made in Arizona, state of Arizona. And they're anti-smoking commercials. I did a number of them. Uh, you know, kind of a doofus who's like, you know, I want to quit, but I don't know if I can. <laughs> Turns into Don Knotts. And then, this is very fortuitous for me, um, during, shortly after I'd, I'd done my run of those, I think uh, seven or eight of them, um, there was a settlement with the tobacco industry and, and the federal government, and a, a great pool of money um, was made available as part of the settlement to various states, and a portion of each of the state's pool was supposed to be used for uh, uh, educational announcements. So they took all the uh, anti-smoking spots that had been made in all the states and basically put them in a bank of available spots. And so uh, every now and again, it'd be like, Georgia has picked up Chuck the Chain Smoker, and Florida is running Chuck the Chain Smoker. So I, you know, that was like a little cash infusion for years, Chuck the Chain Smoker ads. Wow. I almost didn't get that job because uh, well, I, I did get it, and I don't do. I haven't done commercials in years. Um, but uh, I got back from that commercial audition, and I'd, I'd gone in early, as was my my habit, to try and get the copy early, walk around, learn it, come back in. They didn't like reading off cue cards, so I did a good job, and I got the job. And I went in my, for my first fitting, and I met the producer, and the producer said, "Yeah, we almost didn't cast you because we want a blue collar guy, and you got girly arms." And it's like. <laughs> Now I do have I do have girly arms. It's true, but it's like girly arms, really. <laughs> I told my wife this, and she consequently changed my 
my my nickname to Trucker Arms. <laughs> so uh, I, for many years, for my wife, I was called Trucker Arms after uh, those commercials, and I called her Civ Head. So you know, <laughs> I feel like that's a whole other podcast right there. I'm, I'm not going to touch other, that one. All other podcast. <laughs> or queen of the segues, because my wife in conversation can change the subject so quickly that you're left like, wait, wait, what, 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 what? <laughs> well, since we're talking I, about these ads, too, I got to ask about uh, Nintendo. I heard you did Nintendo also, and this must have been like sometime early on, I guess, right? For Nintendo's oh, yeah, existence? This was, this was years ago. This was 30, God, 35 years ago, maybe. Uh, I started out in Seattle, uh, intending to be a stage actor. And 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 if you make a little buck in Seattle, you're you're back then they had occasional films. I think I was in I, I love you to death. I was in a few other things, um, but you also do a lot of uh, uh, industrials, short mm-hmm. films for you know. So yes, I did one for Nintendo that I think was pleasing the difficult customer, and I I marched up with my little Nintendo device. I was very poindextry. This does not work. I'm having. I'm going to need to return it. And they basically, of course, found out that I had the contrast down, so I couldn't see the screen. It's like, oh well, yes, no, all right, very well. Um, and and that was that was dug up and uh, shared. I delight in actually challenging people to find the most meretricious work I've done and and bring it up for public consumption. Shredder <laughs> Orpheus, that's the real challenge. Is the single worst thing I've ever done. And um, although uh, I think some people have found it. It has yet to kind of make itself into uh, onto my Twitter feed um, a uh, a skateboard, a goth skateboard version of the Orpheus and Eurydice story, <laughs> in which he is a, a punk rock skateboard artiste, and I am his manager. And uh, it it was uh, it, it it was it was not a nuanced performance. Let's just say in a non nuanced film. I mean, that sounds like a challenge. Now I have to find that. So I can have an excuse to talk to you again and be like, hey, John, look what I found. And a whole run of a whole run of industrials that I did uh, with um, Harry Anderson um, from Night Court fame uh, that w- was about uh, about na- navigating a dysfunctional workplace, basically. And I did three or four of those uh, back in the. Back in, the, I guess that would have been the late '80s, I think, late '80s, early '90s. I don't remember what those were called, even. Um, but he he was friends with one of the producers and was doing the guy, you know, basically a favor. I mean, Harry Anderson didn't need to do industrials after Night Court, so he showed up, and you know, he was just like he was just having a high old time. He could not he could not get his lines out. He was laughing through every take. It was taking forever. And he was one of those cats who just had sort of an infectious laugh. So I, I I don't know that this has ever happened to me before, but just doing a scene with him the whole time, I was just in hysterics because he was in hysterics. And I felt very badly for the producers. You know, they were like, could we just, could we kind of, could Harry? Um, Anna Ferris. I was in one with Anna Ferris. Anna Ferris, I'll tell you my Anna, Anna Ferris story. I've told this story now several times uh, in the hopes that this is going to make her way back to Anna Ferris. Anna Ferris got into town. I'd done this industrial with her in Seattle. And, and I I had actually gone back to Seattle. I was visiting. They asked me to do one more. This is after I'd moved down here. I said, sure, fine. Okay. And I did one with young Anna Ferris before she moved down here. And uh, a couple of years go by. Maybe Anna was 19, 20. I don't remember. A couple of years go by. And I get this phone call. It was Anna Ferris. Hi, John. Remember me? I'm in Los Angeles. I'm really excited to be here. I just need some, you know, some tips, some hints to navigate the city. What do I do? How do I proceed? And I was like, Well, sure. Anna. I'll I'll meet with you. I'll have some coffee. I'll I'll, I'll give you the rubs. I'll tell you what to. Now, yeah, now, yeah. a day goes by. Like one day, the next day, it's like, Oh, hi, John. Anna Ferris. I just got cast in scary movie. Anyway, never mind. See ya. <laughs> do do but yeah yeah. So now it's like, Hello, Anna. Anna. Hello, Anna Ferris. Is it uh, disconnected? Oh, okay. So, so, I almost bumped into Anna Ferris at a at an event, and you know by now Anna Ferris is a mom, she's a big star. I almost went up to her and said, "Anna, you ghosted me. You wanted me when you wanted me, but as soon as you became a big star, did John Billingsley enter your consciousness again? He <laughs> did not." My wife said, "Don't do that." <laughs> well, it just so happens I have Anna Ferris's number on my phone right now. Uh, we're gonna call yeah. her, and we're gonna let's call her up. Bring it on. Call her up. 
All right, so John, we're coming to a close here, but I feel like I'd be remiss to not give one more question that I need an answer to because I'm a giant Star Trek nerd, FYI, in case you didn't know. No. Uh, and don't no. right, believe it, right? Like what? I never uh, but, I'm also an enormous collector of Star Trek toys. And uh-huh. Dr. Flox has an action figure. It's him in an EV suit. Uh, mm-hmm. I'd love to hear your thoughts on having an action figure. And what do you actually think about it? Does it look like you? Uh, I like the fact that he has a detachable head because my uh, cats used to chase the head around the room. And that was fun for them until <laughs> it got lost. Fortunately, he had a spare head. So I'm down to only one of the two available heads. Um, it, the limbs were uh, malleable, so I could oppose him in uh, in salacious ways. I think for a period of time, he was kept in our house with his head uh, plunged into a cocktail beaker. Um, <laughs> famously, actually, Scott Bakula's action figure was um, photographed in various states of dishabi uh, on our set until Scott, I think, took exception to one particularly prurian photograph and put the kibosh on that. Susie Westmore, I believe, Suzanne Diaz Westmore. Now Suzanne Diaz, uh, who was one of the makeup artists, I believe, was responsible for these photographs, and um, uh, she she had to stop. <laughs> well, you know, there's probably a chance for Flocks to get a second figure soon. I, I don't know if you're aware of the company XO Six, but they're doing some big Star Trek toys. And I, I don't know oh, really? if you know something or don't know something. We probably shouldn't say, but uh, I mean, I'm fingers crossed that we get another daughter, uh, another Doctor Flocks figure, and this time in an actual flocks outfit not just one of those crazy uh, ev suits in my pajamas i know i think the nice thing about putting me in the ev suit was it sort of like eliminated the need for them to actually kind of like you know capture my paunch yeah uh, so uh if they actually do a, a action figure really is not what they, they should mine should be more like a sedentary figure It'd be like <laughs> you know sitting on a chair which reminds me i should plug my show which is the show that I want them to produce, which I, I always plug in hopes that eventually somebody who's on high is going to hear the idea and go, oh, old fat flocks, old fat flocks. <laughs> Every episode begins with old fat flocks sitting in a rocking chair and he's old and he's just sitting there going, oh, back in the day when I was a space doctor, I had all sorts of adventures. There was that time on Riga 4. And then you go into flashback music and a lot of young people run around and act out the episode, including some young, hot version of Dr. Flox. And then at the end, he goes, and it's back to me again. Well, stay tuned next week for another exciting episode of Old Fat Flox. I'm number one in the call sheet. I only have to work about 20 minutes a day. And I, and I, I get a bit fact check. That's my that's my show. Old Fat Flox. I can see the casting notice right now. I can see Chris Hemsworth totally being young Flox. That'd be absolutely, perfect. absolutely. Some handsome young buck as young young Doctor Flox. Anna Faris as young Diesel. Ah, yes, Anna Faris could play one of the one of the lesser aliens. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Bottom of the call sheet. Jamie Presley, she could be in it too. Denzel, if you want a part, come on down. Open casting call. <laughs> I don't know if I want to be Denzel. I'm not sure I'll have him in the show. Well, <laughs> well, I'd love to hear, you know, as we're coming to a close here, I've, I've, I'm going to phrase this, I guess, in the Deep Space Nine way, because it just works out this way. But, you know, uh, we know what you left behind on Enterprise. What did you take with you on that final day on the set? Did you uh, take any flocks makeup home? Did you take a chunk of the chair? Is there anything you brought home with you? Scott Bakula's chained in the bathroom right now. That's where he's been. Yep. That's why he's not in Quantum Leap. That explains it. I, I let him out for work days because he makes a nice living and I, you know, certainly not want to turn down a buck. And then he comes back home. Um, I did. I, t- I took my clothes. Um, I took uh, my eyeballs. I, everything I took, I, I basically auctioned off for charity. I didn't keep anything from for myself. Much as my my <laughs> much as my cluttered room might belie. I, I actually have. I'm not much of a uh, um, a, a memorabilia person. I I love books, but beyond that, uh, you know, and, and people do give you stuff, so I end up with you know uh, oddments and endments here and there. But I had no particular desire to you know grab anything. They also put cameras in the ceiling, <laughs> um, seriously, uh, to keep people from taking shit. So it's like you know um, nobody was going to unbolt the captain's chair or anything like that. I'm sure that people got to kind of stick a phaser here and there in their pocket, but. <laughs> Well, beyond that, I think somebody actually bought all of my little PJs. That's the only thing I like. Even though I had to wear a rubber head, I got to wear pajamas to work. That I like. Did easy wardrobe day at least. Easy wardrobe, yeah. So they they you know, pajamas and slippers. I, I that's what I. It's like Denobial is a planet of Hugh Hefner's, as far as I can tell. <laughs> it's like they're all just slopping around their underpants and they're in the pajamas. Um, uh, somebody bought all of that shit. 
Wow. And, and from Texas. And I met them at a convention and, and they said, oh, I'm going to send you some. Um, you don't have, but okay. And I got this like gargantuan box in the mail and it's all my clothing. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, why you should have kept what you bought it to return to me? So I did eventually auction it all off to charity, I think. Okay. I should have kept a couple of pairs of those pants because they were pretty comfortable. But yeah, I mean, they looked pretty nice as far as Star Trek outfits go. You definitely uh, got the, the good side there. I know. And I wasn't even thinking because, of course, I could have worn them to conventions. It could be like, well, I'm not like John Hurt, so I'm not going to dress up like a Klingon. But, uh, you know, hey, I'm wearing the Dr. Pajamas. <laughs> Authentic Dr. Pajamas. Just don't cut your toenails for a few months and you can just do like the flock spare feet thing, too. Well, I do when I go to conventions, I actually cut my toenails, put them in a little bag and and say whoever asks the most embarrassing question is going to win my toenails. <laughs> along with a poem I've written, I usually write a little poem, a little bit of doggerel that I, you know, sort of along with an autographed picture, just to kind of deflect the questions away from excessively Star Trek centric questions mm -hmm. into the kind of interestingly provocative and embarrassing questions I prefer. I feel like I need to aspire now to getting those toenails one day. I, yeah, well, I know you, you got to work on your embarrassing questions. I'm not sure. I mean, we we did touch on martial law. We got close. I feel like. Well, no, I brought that up myself. I, I know. I, I, I mean, it was on my list. I mean, it's true. All right, it's fair. I'll get. I'll get. All you right. Next time. That's also that wouldn't have embarrassed me. I not that I, anybody ever has embarrassed me. I'm afraid I'm fairly unembarrassable. I'm usually the first one to make fun of myself, so I've usually taken the the field away from everybody else. But uh, it's always fun to see people try. Well, I have a quest now, so I've got to work on that for next time around. This is my quest. This is my interview that I lost control Dr. of. Fox. So we are the man of uh, LaFloxa. <laughs> so, you know, apologies for anybody out there listening whose questions we didn't get to today. Uh, you know, while Denobulans might be very patient and have all the time in the world, I know John has a lot of other things to do, uh, including, once again, a charity event that we do have to touch on one more time. So, John, Hollywood Food Coalition, Trek Talks 2, one last plug. Hollywood Food Coalition, wonderful organization. You can check us out at hofoco.org, or you can go to trektalks.net, which will also link to our site and will contain more information about the show January 14, 10 in the morning Pacific to 6 o'clock in the evening. Panels, musical interludes, fabulous guests, Brent Spiner, John DeLancey, Nana Visitor, Terry Farrell, Armin Shimmerman, Jonathan Frakes, some amazing special guests that we're not going to announce until January 1 that'll blow your mind that we got them. Please tune in and make a donation by way of saying thank you for throwing this digital convention, John Billingsley and pals, to the Hollywood Food Coalition. So visit again, trektalks.net for more details. We're going to have all those links in the description and the show notes for this episode. So again, do not miss out January 14th. Be there. It's going to be awesome. Uh, shout out again to the Trek Geeks podcast for helping me connect today with Mr. Billingsley here. And uh, John, if, if I was going to have a starship of my own, I would definitely have Flocks on board as my doctor without a doubt. But more so, I'd want to have John Billingsley himself on the ship there to help keep me sane. So fabulous. I'd happily accept. I uh, John Billingsley would be far too frightened to go off in a starship. He's <laughs> not like William Shatner. I don't, I don't want to go into space. That's like, you know, even just what I saw in the paper yesterday about those poor people flying to Hawaii that hit their heads on the ceiling. I don't even want to do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, thank Dr. you. Flux, Dr. Flox braver than John Billingsley. Well, either way, though, I mean, it's been great chatting today with you about Star Trek, but more so the other things outside of Star Trek, because it was really wonderful being able to explore some of those things, talking about cold space and martial law. I think you should air this interview backwards, because it starts yeah. it starts with great seriousness, and it ends in lightness and good humoredness. You may just have to air it backwards. That's true. Or maybe that's going to be, if we play it backwards, it'll be a completely different message, perhaps. Play it backwards, like that Beatles album. That's right. Exactly. But, yeah, for real, John. I mean, it's it's wonderful here. You are an actor's actor, and uh, you are a true mensch for all the good work that you're doing out there in the world. So, thank you for all the wonderful work you do with your charity organizations. Uh, just, yeah, just wonderful, wonderful things. And uh, it's been honestly a real honor to be able to talk with you today and spend this time with you. So, uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Appreciate all the time, all the energy. Uh, I'm gonna stop rambling, but big thing. Thank you. And one more time, TrekTalks.net. See you guys on the 14th. That's it for this week's episode of Trek Untold. Until next time, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Trek Untold, all one word. If you'd like to directly support this podcast, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter over on patreon.com slash trekuntold, which gives you access to some great perks that can't be beat. Or pick up some merchandise from our store, or use my Amazon shop link to check out all kinds of different Star Trek merchandise. Links for all these things are in the show notes. 
Shout out to Triple Fiction Productions for being a key sponsor of Trek Untold. Don't forget to check them out and all of the fine folks whose ads you've seen or heard on this podcast, too. If you have any questions, feedback, or comments for the show, or would like to suggest a guest or discuss sponsorship options for any of these episodes in the future, send me a message at trekuntold at gmail.com. I hope to see you here again as we uncover more untold stories from Star Trek and beyond and get to know even more amazing people who have contributed to this ever-expanding universe. Until next time, I'm Matthew Kaplowitz, and remember, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold is sponsored by treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms, is powered by the Rageworks Podcasting Network, and is affiliated with Nerd News Today.